folks, Quill18 here, and welcome to another episode of our tutorial for Crusader Kings 2 for complete beginners. And these uh, the little handful of videos we're going to do here, we're going to try to be very, very detailed um, and a very, you know, just absolutely for beginners introduction to the game. The idea is hopefully after, you know, a little handful of videos here, you'll then be able to transition to just watching Let's Plays and, and following along what's going on there and learning things or maybe learning mostly what not to do by watching Let's Plays, that's entirely possible as well. I'm running this game without any expansions whatsoever, just basic vanilla Crusader Kings 2, which is available for free now, uh, which is kind of amazing. And we've got this big giant world to play in and we are way over here. This is us, this is our territory, the petty kingdom of Mumu on the island of Ayr. And uh, we've got dreams though. Maybe we'll be able to go and, um, and make ourselves the king of Ireland proper. It could happen. We'll see how it goes. Over the top here, we've got our very last alert about the game telling us, hey, there's a thing you probably want to deal with here. Um, let's go ahead and do that. It's, we've got some idle council members. If we click on it, it'll open the correct window, or we can click on this button here for the council. So every realm has a council with five positions, chancellor, marshal, steward, spymaster, and court chaplain. Each one of these positions coincides with one of the five attributes that all characters have. So King Fred over here, that's us, has a diplomacy, martial, stewardship, intrigue, and learning skill. And those five skills over there are also the council. The skill of your counselors do boost your state skill. So we only have a learning of one, but thanks to our spouse, who's giving us a plus five, and our counselor, who's giving us a plus 13, we have a state learning of 19, which still isn't fantastic, but at least it's not, you know, single digits. Um, so that's okay. So these five positions, and we have someone that operates in these positions, someone in our court. Let's talk about our court for a second before we start messing with the council here. If we click on our face, we look at the tab over here of vassals. These are all the people who bend the knee to us. For us here in Mumu, that's three chieftains over here, plus the bishop, uh, within our own county. These are the vassals that bend the knee to us and give us support in wars and, and various things like that. And keeping them happy is pretty important. But we also have a court. These are all people living in the court. These are all the people who are trying to influence us and interact with us on a daily basis. We are one of the people in our own court, as are our vassals. So there's you know the chief of, uh, of Irma over here. One of the chiefs, he's in there. Our bishop is in there. Yep, that's fine. But then we've got other people. These are people who don't necessarily rule any land. We've got some of our commanders and random courtiers. So uh, Ewa over here, she doesn't have anything. She doesn't have any land. She's not married. Um, she's lowborn. She's not even from a big family. Um, you know, in feudal terms, she's nothing. But she's still here. She's still present. Um, there may be th ways that we can interact with her. Uh, first of all, I mean, we could marry her to someone. We could have married her to our son. Instead, we married our son to the princess of Germany, which seems like it, it politically was kind of a strong move. So, you know, good on us over there. Uh, but we could have done that. The other thing is, if she likes us and we're plotting, let's say we're doing, like we're trying to assassinate someone. If she likes us, we might be able to convince her to join in on the plot and help us to uh, murder someone in the face. So we've got our court over here. Now, from this court is also the group of people that we can assign to our council. So anyone in our court can be assigned to the council. Caveat, exclamation mark, or asterisk over here. Um, in in most kingdoms, you can't assign ladies to your court because sexism. Uh, so you can't necessarily have everyone in your court applied there, but um, that is the idea. You can sort of grab them from anything. They don't have to be your vassals. Um, you can invite more people to your court, by the way. So right now we have 14 people in our court, and actually we have a limit of 30. And that's just based on the size of our kingdom and various things like that. Uh, bigger places will have more more people in their court. So we could have more. Now this will happen as people, I don't know, have babies or we take more territory things. We can also invite people to our court, which is something I quite like to do. If we go down to the bottom right corner over here, there's a find characters button, right? We were looking at it earlier. Let's go ahead. I'm just gonna reset the filter and clear out the genius searcher over here. Um, and this is all the characters who exist in the world. And there are thousands of them. Some of them might be too far away for us to actually interact with diplomatically. Uh, you can also filter. So this is the court. So this is only going to show the people within my court. Here's only going to search my vassals and their court. So it's a little bit bigger. Um, here's the entire realm, which is going to be kind of similar, but still within our realm of Mumu over here. Oh, right. This can happen. Um, let's say I'm in the kingdom of West France over here, but I'm not the king. Let's say I'm a duke. So search vassals will be the counts below me. 
search realm will go up to the king and everyone below him as well. So in our case, because we're the king and we're independent, realm and vassal is gonna be the same. But there's that, and then all is everyone in the world. But you can still filter by diplomatic range. So we can say, listen, only show us people who we can actually interact with because you know they're in range of us sending a messenger to them. So there's that. And yeah, we can say, hey, show me everyone who's interested in joining my court. We set this to yes. Then we've got, these are all people. This is what the little thumbs up is. These are people who are willing to join my court. If I have that set to any, we're gonna have no's, we might have yeses. These people with the hand here, they'd be willing to join us if um, if we made them like us a little more. If we sent them a bribe, which we can do. If I can right click, I can send a gift. Then they'd like me enough to be willing to join my court. But yeah, we can just set this to yes. And then I can be like, listen, I'm looking at my council over here. And uh, you know, our chancellor's not that great with only an 11. Let's sort this by diplomacy. Scroll up. Hey, 17. Oh, hold on. Can't be a lady. We're not allowed, so we have to get, pick, filter it to men. Okay, well, we've got a guy over here who's got a diplomacy of 15. Let me right-click on him, and I'm going to invite him to my court. And he's going to say yes. We already knew he was going to do that. We also got people. He's got a claim. Uh, at Nolf over here, he's got a claim to a title. If we invite him to our court, we might be able to press claims on his behalf and do sneaky, sneaky things like that. I'm not going to bother. I'm just going to go ahead and unpause. We'll get a pop-up in a couple of days that... Um, what's his face? There you go. Um... Torcato has joined our court. Great stuff. So in theory now, if I look at my chancellor and I hit the appoint button over here, there we go. Torcato is now in the list of people I can appoint to chancellorship. Uh, this is sorted by default. It will be sorted by the skill that is relevant for the role. So here it's sorted by diplomacy. If I click on steward, it's going to be sorted by stewardship. Spy master will be sorted by intrigue. Ooh, yeah, see, I should appoint my son as my spy master. Look like at that. Now this guy, if I do that, this guy here is going to be pissed. That I fired him. Sucks to be him. I'm going to appoint my son. So people who get appointed will like you more. Uh, so there you go. If I mouse over the relationship over here, this is really useful to know why people like you or don't like you. So my son here, um, you, you get a base relationship based on your personal diplomacy skills. So we have a diplomacy of 11. So he likes me 11. We've been ruling for a long time. Good stable realm. So he likes that. This son here doesn't like gavel kind succession. We're going to talk about succession uh later but he doesn't like gavelkind succession because he's my firstborn son and in gavelkind it requires that you split when you die your realm gets split up among a variety of your siblings so he doesn't like this law because it might require him to share with his brother it turns out in this particular case it's a moot because we don't have enough land to split it between brothers so he's going to get everything anyway but he's not too keen on that on the other hand i'm willing to bet if we check our second son here im chad and we looked at his opinion of me over here. He loves the idea of Gavelkind succession because it means he might get something when I die. He won't in this particular case, but we're going to talk about succession laws um, in a bit because it's it's a big hairy topic. Anyway, so you can check to see why people like you. Can you see here? He's a spy master, so he likes me plus ten because of that. He doesn't like me. Um, he's got a minus fifteen because he's envious. He's jealous of me. Don't worry, dude. I'm going to die soon. You'll have everything. You'll be fine. But yeah, do be careful about envious people in your realm or ambitious people in your realm. They can start some crap really fast. Now, your council can be given jobs. It is worth noting, um, one of the expansions adds a fourth job type over here, which is just sort of passive. Um, so they just sort of just chill and do that without being assigned anywhere, and they do a thing. Um, you'll you'd still likely want to be able to assign people to... Um, specific jobs from time to time, but it's worth noting things are a little bit different uh, depending on your expansions. But let's go down here. Our chancellor over here, he's our diplomatic guy. He can do a few things. He can improve diplomatic relations. If we stick him somewhere, um, he's going to have a chance of improving relations with the, the lords who are there. So let's say one of my chieftains is a little cranky pants at me. I might want to go and send my chancellor over there to make friends with that lord. And there's a chance, I mean, there's a chance he could do poorly, but there's a chance he'll improve it. And it depends mostly on his skill. Um, so that's one thing we could do. The other thing we could do is we could sow dissent over here on the right, which we could put him somewhere and it will cause dissent between a lord somewhere and his own, like his liege and things like that. Um, I don't think there's a real good use case for it in here, in this particular scenario, but it is a way for you to start some crap. Now this doesn't have to be within your own realm. I could decide, hey, um, I want, at some point, I'm going to want to go to war with my neighbor over here in, uh, in Conant, right? So I might want to go and sow some dissent over here so that the, the chiefs don't like the, the king of Conant as much. Ooh, fancy. The other thing you can do is have them fabricate claims. 
So fabricate claims means basically, so I need a cause for war, right? Well, I could go and have send the chancellor over here to uh, Osraik. Let's say I'm going to do that. Click. There he is. He's on the map now. He's going to go around here and he's going to like try to like fraudulently make a claim that this this county of, of Osraig is it belongs to me like oh two generations ago my father he ruled this place and he was supposed to inherit it and blah 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 we're gonna like you know we're gonna do forgeries we're gonna do paper we're gonna try to fabricate a claim on this which will give us a good cause to go to war later on now this dude's not very good at that uh only a 4.6 percent chance per year to successfully do it and he actually has a 3.8 percent chance per year of just pissing people off because his uh, diplomacy skill is pretty poor. We might want a better chancellor than this. Um, you don't want anyone low, like lower than, like, you want at least double digits. And ideally, you'd like 20 or more. Uh, I mean, 15 or more is pretty good. 20 or more is amazing. So I'm really happy with our spy master here, for example, and not too impressed with anyone else. Um, once you assign them to a job, you can't assign them to a different job for a little while. Uh, it looks like about six months before you can swap them. So keep that in mind. Our marshal here can suppress revolt somewhere, lowering revolt risk. Uh, he can train troops, which will give us a bigger levy. We're gonna talk about military later on. He can also organize raids, which is something that I believe we can only do because we're tribal. Different government types have different actions here, but it's got a chance of generating a ton of troops that we can then go and use to go raiding. So the 16% chance per year of having just an army spontaneously appear, just the, the peasant rabble, 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 decide, you know, like, are, have been encouraged to go raiding. I'm gonna go ahead and just train troops over here. And if we do this, you'll see most of the world grays out. Only green provinces are places where you can assign your counselor to do this. And basically train troops, we are gonna be training troops in a province, in a county we directly control. Hey, we only have the one. Desmond over here, so we're going to try to train troops in Desmond. Alrighty. Our steward, he's in charge of money, so he can uh, settle tribes, will allow us to change culture of a province. So let's talk about culture. Our character has a religion, we are Catholic, and a culture, um, which is Irish over here, and tribal is the type of government we are. So we are Irish Catholic. Um, the There are map modes over here to see that. There's the religious map mode, so there's the Catholic world. And there's a cultural map mode, which is, oh, the book right next to it. There you go. Irish cultures, French, Occitane, different cultures like that. Now, it's worth noting that the culture of the liege, the character us, which is Irish Catholic, doesn't necessarily equal the culture of the province. It so happens here that Desmond is, in fact, um, Irish Catholic, but there could be a mismatch. So there may have been a, uh, a thing where we would want to send our steward to go and try to convert one of our provinces from, I don't know, Scottish to Irish or something like that. Um, all of our cultures is is Irish here, so everything is grayed out. We can't send him to do that. We can also send him to, we can assign him to oversee construction somewhere. If we do this, it will decrease the amount of time it takes to build stuff. And then there's also possible events. And finally, there's build a legend, which we can send him somewhere. He'll spread our legend among the people. It's gonna increase our prestige by quite a bit, 1.2 per month. Right now our prestige gain is one per month. So this will more than double our prestige gain. And every year there's a chance some warriors will rise up ready to go to war. Rabble, 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 rabble. Um, it's a little bit dangerous because if we can't go to war with them, they're just gonna get cranky. Uh, but sure, you know what? We'll try to build a legend up over here in the, uh, Desmond so that we can get some extra prestige. Look at that, so now we're at 0.23, or 2.3 prestige per month, which is pretty good. Spymaster, we can have him scheme, which helps d d discover plots. So if, some, if it turns out someone's trying to assassinate us, we may or may not know about it. There's always a chance of discovering those plots, but if we've got our Spymaster scheming where we are, there's an increased chance he'll find that. Um, we can also have him build a spy network so that we are more powerful at plotting. We're gonna look at plotting and schemes in a little bit. Um, but you can do that. We can also have him study technology, which is pretty amazing. If we hit this, it'll highlight the map. Anywhere green are places that have better technology than we do. And this will all of a sudden give us a chance to steal some of that technology. Now do note, there's a chance our spy master gets discovered. He might be imprisoned and killed. That's not normally so bad, except this is our son. If he gets imprisoned or killed, well, that's not good for us. So we may not want you to do that. For now, I'm gonna keep you safe. I'm just gonna have you scheme to discover plots. I'm gonna keep you in our capital over here. So you're gonna be used defensively. Generally speaking, you're mostly gonna use your spy master to study technology unless you need something very specific. But because he's my son and I don't want him to die, I'm gonna keep him at home. 
So maybe I shouldn't have swapped uh, Spy Masters because maybe I would have wanted to send him to study technology instead. Oh well. Finally, we got a court chaplain here. He uses the learning skill and is responsible for religious duties. Um, he, duty. Uh, he can prophetize, so you can send him somewhere to try to convert heretics. So um, we can send him anywhere within our realm. Each one of these provinces is already Catholic. It's possible that some of these provinces might have people in them, you know, some of the lords or whatever might not be Catholic, so I could still go and send them somewhere to try to convert people, but I don't think that's going to be terribly useful in this case. We can also use it to improve religious rela uh, relations. We can send them somewhere, and he will suck up to the religious people in that province to make them like me better. Now, he's the person here. I can't send him in the own province. I could send him somewhere else. I can also send him, I could send him to Rome. Rome, make the Pope like me more. That's a possibility. And the third one over here, build zeal. Will give me monthly piety and give me a chance to raise an army of zealots for some sort of religious war. Whoo. Tell you what, I'm going to send my court chaplain to Rome. That sounds like a pretty cool idea. Let's go ahead and do that. Hopefully the Pope will like me more and maybe we can ask him for some favors. All right, that's our council. Those are all of our alerts dealt with. And this would be a fine time. We could unpause. And let's do that for a bit and see what develops. And then we're going to look at these other menu options. But well, let's just see what happens. It's random. If you're playing along with this, completely different things may happen. Okay, I'll go to speed five. Oh, someone's gone to war. There you go. Pausing over here. So you can see some troops moving around here. If I go and take a look at Chief uh, Donchad, he is at war with King Olaf of Sudrejar in a holy war for Meath. Oh... Meath is over here, and while the province is Irish and Catholic, it is being ruled by King Olaf. King Olaf is Germanic pagan, and he's Norse culture. Yeah, holy war over there. We've got some Norse people that control some bits of our land over here, and as Catholics, these people say, this shall not stand. We have to go and kick out these um, these heathens. So they're going to war. Eh, good on them. So. Um, all right, we can pause and let some more things happen, but let's take a look at some of these menus. So we've taken a look at the council menu. So we've got our council positions and minor titles. What's the next button? Laws. You're not going to interact with this screen too often, but when you do, it's going to have some very, very, very powerful things. And one of the biggest things on the screen is the inheritance laws of our realm. So we take it for granted that when the king dies, his oldest son, or possibly oldest child in general, but generally speaking, oldest son, inherits the kingdom, right? That's always how it works, right? Well, no, turns out a lot of kingdoms had a lot of different laws when it came to succession. So there's two sides to the succession laws. The first side, the gender laws, is the simplest to explain. Can women inherit and with what priority? So in a um, agnatic gender law, so agnatic over here, only men inherit. If you have only daughters and you die, then it's going to be your brother or your third cousin or something who inherits the the, uh, the realm instead of anything. You, your women in an agnatic kingdom cannot inherit at all. In a absolute cognatic, this is women are on the same grounds as men. Um, so it would be your eldest child, generally speaking, depending on succession laws, your eldest child, regardless of gender, who would inherit. This is actually very rare in CK2, um, unless you set like the when you, the game options to full gender balance. This, generally speaking, is not a thing that exists. Even in um, in in our more modern world, it was only in the late 1900s, I think. No, actually, wasn't it just with like Kate and Will's kid when she was pregnant? I think that they that England. Um, changed the laws, or I should say the United Kingdom, changed the laws to absolute technatic. Because up until then, if with Kate and Wills, if their firstborn child was a girl and their secondborn child was a dude, the dude would inherit. And they're like, okay, maybe this is a little outdated. So I think it's only that recently that the United Kingdom passed basically absolute technatic, where it was the oldest child, period, inherits things. Um, and then there's what we've got over here, which is agnatic technatic. Agnatic technatic is Men inherit preferentially. So if you have a man-child, that person will be your heir. If you don't have a man-child, but you have a lady-child, then your lady-child will inherit. 
Um, and that's, you know, it's fairly, it's fairly safe and secure over here in CK2. It's good because you have more backup heirs, right? Like if both our sons die, we still have a daughter who could inherit as a backup, uh, which, which is nice. So we've got that. You can change laws by clicking on the little um, mallet over here. If it's, if it's lit up and it's got the green check mark, you can just hit this button and pass this law. Uh, depending on things, you might have a council that, that weighs in or things like that, but we don't have it in this case. So we would just be able to change the laws to agnatic if we wanted to. But that would be that would probably be bad because it would lessen, worsen our, our ability to have heirs. And you can see our line of succession over here. It's Ken followed by Chad, followed by Lurban. This is our line of succession over there. Happens to represent their age, but if Lurban had been my eldest child, she would still be third in line of succession because agnatic cognatic. Then you got the second part over here the succession laws currently it's in gavel kind um this is what actually determines um regardless of gender who inherits we are used to um primogeniture is the way we used to, we we are used to thinking of inheritance primogeniture means the eldest child of the appropriate gender is the child who inherits everything the eldest child inherits everything in primogeniture in Gavelkind, the eldest child gets first dibs at the highest title, but then things get subdivided. If we had more than one county, and we only have one right now of, of Desmond, so we only have one, so Ken is going to inherit that one, and Chad is going to get nothing. If we had two counties, Ken would inherit one, and Chad would inherit the second one. If we had three, Ken would inherit two of them, I believe, and Chad would have the, the third extra one. Um, and I don't think that our daughter is going to inherit anything because she has brothers and life sucks and is critically unfair. Um, but that's Gavelkind. Gavelkind sort of splits up your holdings. In terms of gameplay, you don't really want Gavelkind because you want to be able, when you die and you play as your heir, you want to still have all your stuff together. In this case, when we die, our heir might not have as much stuff as our current character. Some of it might go to our brother Z and split up our realm quite a bit. Um, this is a, especially a problem if you have multiple high-level titles, right? So um, the counties get spread out, but if we had two duchies, right? This petty kingdom of, of Mumu is a duchy-level title. If we had two duchy-level titles, when we died, one of them would go to Ken and one of them would go to Chad, and our realm would be split in two. We would have, you know, Ken ruling over here and um, Chad ruling over here, and that would be quite poor. If we have two counties, it's not so bad. One of the counties goes to Chad, but Chad would still bend the knee to Ken because Ken is the one who inherits the higher level title. Anyway, I know that's a little fuzzy, but anyway, you uh, you will may want you, you will want to mess with some of these maybe. Primogeniture is nice because it keeps everything together. Elective is kind of interesting. Instead of your oldest child, basically, in that you you instead like all your vassals vote on who is going to inherit things. This is elective Gavelkind, but there's also elective primogeniture. Uh, Tanistry is also voting, but it's people of your dynasty, I think, or it elects people from your dynasty, and it's a whole other thing. Um, and older people tend to be preferred for this, uh, which is it's kind of nifty keen, but we won't make any changes. Also, Rem Law is over here. If you do have, uh, depending on your, your government type, like right now we're just a tribal chieftain, but your government type and your technology, more things will show up here. Also, expansions and things will change things. Uh, there's very little here, mostly because we're pretty low tech and unsophisticated government type. Um, but we can change how centralized our empire is. Notice we don't have the ability to change it right now because, well, mostly we're missing like certain amount of like, it's reliant on other laws and can also be reliant on other technologies like legalism, for example. So I can't change the centralization. I could change our tribal organization though from minimum over to low. So with minimum tribal organization, our tribes, people our vassals, right? The other chieftains here love this because they're very, they're basically independent. They, they, they sort of bend the knee to me. They acknowledge that I have the shiniest crown, but that's about all. As we move over here, we will start to have more centralized power. In one of the examples here is we're going to have the ability to revoke titles of people who are cranky pants. We'll also be able to enact lower centralization, right? If we go to low tribal organization, later on, we'll be able to do the low centralization. So this is actually something quite cool. But notice we're going to go from a plus five opinion to a minus five opinion. That's a 10 point swing in opinion with our vassals. They're really not going to be pleased with this, but we might want to go ahead and do that. Um, there's also obligations over here, and depending on expansions that you have, this screen can look a fair bit different. But basically, how much of a demand do we have from our vassals? 
levies. We still haven't talked about the military, but this is basically how much troops our vassals have to give us. Right now it's at normal. Um, if we had our legalism at seven or higher, we could go to max, which means that our vassals are forced to give us more of their troops when we go to war. How much are we taxing people? And so on and so forth. And there's basically three different holdings you can have in each one of these counties. There's baronies like castles, which is basically a feudal one. There's cities and there are churches. And you can levy troops and tax the church and the city and the feudal lords. Um, cities don't give you many troops, but they do give you a lot of taxes. Churches are sort of balanced in a sense. Um, and the feudal lords don't make a lot of money, but they have a lot of troops. But anyway, you can tune this and, and require, you know, more and less stuff from you. To keep in mind, the, the more intense you levy or tax, the less happy people will be. We're going to go back to realm, though. I'm going to go ahead with low tribal organization. So we're going to do that. It'll upset some people. Deal with it. Ah, the council, though, there's going to be a bit of an election. Current support for new laws. We're at three of ten. List of opponents. So our vassals have different amounts of votes for things and may or may not vote in favor of this change. Um, so we may want to suck up to people to try to convince them to vote for this. If you do have, uh, I think, conclave expansion, there's a lot more political like shenanigans that you can do to try to influence people to go one way or another. But uh, Brandub over here, let me see. I'm going to send you a gift, buddy. I'm going to give you 15 gold so you like me a lot more. Hopefully that means you'll vote for this. We'll see how it goes. I'm just going to go ahead and close this. We'll let the game play a little bit more. So that was the laws. There we go. They approved it. I, I don't think I needed to spend the money or anything like that. But just to say that's something you can consider. So, low tribal organization law has now been passed. If we take a look at the laws, that's that. Now, I can't change um, can't change centralization um, right now because we have to wait. We can only change laws once every 10 years. But we will be able to do this one because... Yeah, because one of the following must be true, one of the following must be true. We will be able to change our centralization to low once 10 years have passed. And obligations is also locked because we change the laws. Inheritance is not. It's its own thing over here. Um, but we're not going to mess with that. Next menu, technology. Technology is not a major gameplay feature in Crusader Kings 2. The, 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 the sort of advance of technology wasn't something that was really in the consciousness of people at this time. The idea that things could change and be improved and developed wasn't something people were, were truly aware of on a grand scale. Um, and as a result, technology uh, mostly proceeds fairly slowly, and you don't have a ton of influence over this. You can sometimes, you will accrue technology points, and you can use that to speed up your, your technology development in one category or another. But basically, technology flows, um, I think there's a technology map mode. What does it look like? I guess, actually, this is not the way to do it. If we go to technology over here... There. If we mouse over things, we can see different numbers. You can see how, like, the bars are changing. There we go. Italy has, like, really good city and temple technology. Byzantine Empire will have crazy good tech over here, as you can see. Um, I thought there was... I don't know. I think there is, and I'm just not remembering it. Anyway. Um, so technology will automatically spread from neighboring provinces that have higher numbers. You can also speed things along by sending your spy somewhere. Um, and just over time, will go up. Your, your learning skill will influence how quickly technology sort of grows on its own in your capital as well. So having a high learning skill is pretty nice for that. The thing with technology is some things just give you a bonus. As you get up to, say, infantry levels that are higher, uh, your troops will have more morale. So you'll have more competent infantry as you go on over here. Uh, some of the big ones are some of these economy advances because they'll actually unlock buildings. When we get to level two of castle infrastructure, we'll be able to unlock new upgrades for our buildings, which we'll look at relatively soon. So those are big deals. Legalism is a big deal because the higher your legalism laws, the more types of better laws you can pass, which is really, really, really nice. But mostly it just goes on its own. That's technology. Um, let's take a moment here before the end of the video. Well, no, I'll put a cut in here because it's going to be a big topic because what we're going to do is we're going to talk about buildings in your holding. So we're going to put a cut in there. We'll do that. And we'll also talk about military in the next episode, which is kind of a big topic. Folks, thanks for watching. I'm going to see you guys next time.